på Fjernøys, hvor det vanligvis er i Oskansen. Og, ja, vi tar om å gå til bare bare. Så, David! Takk! Well, it's certainly great to be here again, those many familiar faces and spines that I see out there. <laughs> and some new ones that we get our, get our hands on today. So I, I'd love to discuss a little bit about what gives me passion here, what brings me to work with you and your spine, and also a little bit where I've come from. I come from Iowa, close to Wisconsin. And there, my parents were chiropractors. My uncles were chiropractors. My cousins are chiropractors. I was 12 years old before I understand what aspirin did. I mean, just to make any sense, an aspirin commercial on TV that people would, don't they just go to my father? <laughs> it's just one of the things. So, and then I went on to try to understand what was happening in uh, what, all these wondrous things I saw in my life. I went on to get a degree in psychobiology, how psychology and biology interact. And then a graduate degree in neuroscience, and by that time, I learned everything there was to know that was known about the brain and physiology. And I go, that's it? We don't know much. <laughs> so as I went into chiropractic myself then, I realized what my job was to do is to turn on what is natural inside us. Bring on that aliveness that brings us into health, into joy, into relationship. It's not about, I found, trying to fix something. Because we don't know enough how to fix something. We don't even know why it's broken. Or if it is. I mean, is pain bad or is it good? Who knows? So, my job, and this is what I've come into in greater passion, is how to create aliveness in each of you and in myself. And how to create alive relationships between us. Many people have relationships that are inside their commitment. They have commitment. Inside is a relationship. Is the relationship alive in there? It may have started that way, but now how is it not? So the people will continue with their commitment, whether it's to themselves or to other people, and not have such a great relationship inside. So how do we help that increase? How do we help aliveness come back into that? So that's, that's where my path is now. Because it just, but that's what I want to do. So that's where I, I find network creates that aliveness within me that I can bring to others. The three types of relationships that I find we need alive, aliveness in. Yes, I want relationships with others to be alive. But before I can have that, I need to really have an alive relationship with me. If I can't have a great relationship with myself, how can someone else? And before that even, I find I want an alive relationship with the now moment being right here. I want it to be delicious, to be able to do, mm, it is so amazing and delicious to be right here, right now. But what we find when people come sit on our tables in network, they come into this beautiful, peaceful room that Jack and Henrik and everyone has created here. And they sit on the table, it's peaceful and joyous in there. <laughs> and their face is smiling, but their spine is not. So the spine, we call, that's the back of your mind. That's the past. And sometimes the front is tight. So whenever we're keeping a story real from the past or the future, we're living in it. And you know how much of us is in the now moment? Not much. <laughs> or maybe you'll, quite a bit. But part of us is in the past, or part of us in the future. We're lost. I mean, there's only one place you can be. Right here. How can people get lost? Here I am. Go ahead, call myself. <laughs> but if we're keeping the tension in our body, some part of my brain is living as if that story is real. And now in the, re in the moment, in the real moment, we only can respond, react. It's really, really great to respond in the moment sometimes. But you don't really learn from that. You react and respond. That's what we're designed to do. We learn from the past stories. We, we plan from our future stories. But when we keep them real, we keep reacting. 
as if they're already happening or still happening. So what we'll do in network, we're going to check your spine and go, oh, past. That's a story you're keeping. So what we're going to work with is that those parts of the brain and help them find each other. Because there is one part of the brain that's always going, what do I need next? What do I need next? Where am I going? And, oh, it's a bathtub. Who's a race? Here's a bear. <laughs> well, in the body, there's really two states. Either peaceful, easy, healing, digestive mode. I just had lunch. Hmm. Or fight, flight, or freeze. Fight, flight, freeze. Run from a bear. Because when the bear's chasing you, you don't need to digest because you might be lunch. Who wants to digest? Well, you gotta, you gotta go. You don't want to heal yesterday's injury because you might get more injuries if you don't put the energy into it. You don't want to, no reason to put energy into regenerating yourself because you may not make it till tomorrow. Or even no need to feel the fact the bear already bit you. You gotta go. And on Tuesday, before I came to Norway, someone came to my office brand new. I was telling her the story. And she goes, yeah, I was bit by a bear. <laughs> <laughs> and then here, and here, and then I go like, <laughs> and I'm no, no, I'm sorry. And like, I, I, I'm so sorry, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm so sorry I'm smiling so proudly. But you, oh my God, you really were bit by a bear? <laughs> you know? and, and she said, and I asked her, did, did you feel the fact that it had already bitten you? Before a bitch would get, no, I was getting out of there, man. And she says, yeah. And she's like, she, so she explained exactly what I've been for 20 years telling this story to practice members. Finally, someone came in who'd been bit by a bear, but I felt so <laughs> I felt so bad that I was so happy about it. <laughs> but, uh, but she understood. I had to tell I'm sorry. But I just couldn't get the smile off my face. But, uh, no, but anyway, so she had a, she's had a rough time. I was right. So, um, <laughs> I could help uh, have fun with it. But so I asked her, can I tell people, can I please tell people about this? She said, okay. Because the fight, fight, or freeze, that is designed to last until you get away from that bear. How she got away from the bear, I and mean, it bit you twice here and there, she must have really had some spur of energy. I mean, she was up in the woods, and wow, that's amazing. But that's why we have that ability. But it's designed to last just for a little while. In our modern society, it lasts for days, years, decades, your whole life. You'll have people think, thinking that old age is, is this, getting more and more. That's what people think you do when you get older. You get more tight. You get more, more hunched over. Ah, that's just keeping your story longer and longer. It stays in the system longer and longer. It's like we, we shore it up like a tree. You get more rings, more... You know, oh, I've got these thicker muscles. Ha ha, I've kept this story on for 25 years. You know, it's something I was almost real proud of. But that's not really old age. Old age is wisdom. Old age is being able to see beyond what, what goes on in everyday moment. It's becoming the, for the masculine, becoming the father, the leader we need to be. For the feminine, it's becoming more and more that earth goddess, that mother, that sense of here I am being holding the space for those around me. So when we carry the fight, flight, or freeze, those systems that are fed by that area don't heal, regenerate, digest, or feel as well as they could. Wow. Some people don't want to feel things. But actually, we don't want to feel the story. So the story we keep real is what we're afraid of. In fact, it's the story that people keep real we don't like. It's not like we don't like a person. It's really we don't like how they react to us or respond to us. That's through the stories they're keeping real. So it's amazing how once in a while I have that person come into the office that is really tough to get around. Oh, they're so kind of intense or this way. And you know, after about a year, I found a lot of those people. I'm off skiing with them for a week in, in Switzerland, and I'm off doing this, and they become my best friends. The same people that I didn't like, as they freed up those stories, they become, I could see their soul, I knew who they were. They, they, they were with me in, in relationship. So that's where we want to go. The 
contacts that we make in network have to be pretty gentle. If they're too, too hard, it'll put a man war into fight, flight, or freeze. Mm -hmm. We have to access the system. What I was studying in neuroscience at Northwestern University in Chicago was how the little tiny receptors in the skin affect the whole system. Mm -hmm. They found that you can take one tiny, what they call free nerving, free nerve ending, free nerve ending afferent going into the nervous system, it could shut down one little thing. It could shut down the entire uh, musculature of the body. They're very, very powerful. So we're going to be taking contacts very specifically. Because if you go too deep at the beginning, you're going to activate something different. So we have found that if we take contacts in just the right way, it sends information to that part of the brain that's rechecking and saying, hey, did you know this guy over here was still living in that? And they go, whoa, what? Hey, 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 it's peaceful. It's nice. Oh. So on the table, you're going to feel muscles relax. Bones are going to start sliding on top of each other again instead of being rigid. Connective tissue is going to need to unwind. That means when you're on the table, you're going to need to move. Okay? So if you don't think you should move, you're not going to be successful. So you might find yourself on the table, laying there, and go, wait, yeah, I kind of want to do this. Oh, no, no, I can't do that. <laughs> no, one. Oh. 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 oh, yeah. Ah. So if you don't move on the table, we're going to tell you to wiggle. Now, that's a little more embarrassing when you have to wiggle. I mean, that's like a kid. I got to wiggle. Oh. No, move. So move your legs, move whatever you need to do. Let it just unwind, and then it'll, it'll complete pretty quickly. There's been some great research recently that I've seen that has talked about this very thing. Where they're seeing that when they study the brain, there's some resting activity. When you're just sitting there, there's activity going on in the brain in all sorts of different places. And they're thinking that, wow, maybe because this is, they're finding it in the areas that deal with, with aggression. They're, they're finding it in areas that deal with uh, extroversion, with fear, and they're thinking, well, maybe this is the underpinnings of personality. I'm saying that, that is the evidence that we have and are keeping stories real. Because what we found in our studies with network, in the same type of studies where you're brain mapping activity, is that before and after an this one particular entrainment, the resting activity, the, the amount, the efficiency of the brain in making movements, which is a, shows you, it's like, if there's a lot of noise, you gotta scream louder to, to be heard. Same thing in the brain. If there's a lot of background resting noise or activity that doesn't deal with what you're doing, you have to use a lot more of the brain to, to do a simple activity. So what we found in the network, after network entrainment, there was 30,000% less activity in the resting brain after the entrainment. That's pretty peaceful. The researchers have never seen anything more than maybe 50 or 60% change from whatever they'd studied. So 30,000% more, they're like, they were going down the halls going, hey, pulling people out of offices, look at this, the brain mapping. And it, it's extraordinary. The, Changes we're going to see in your spine will, will come from that in your life. If you don't have this background activity, things shift. I asked one little boy here, his father had been coming in, kind of a stiff, intense kind of guy. I can't really tell what exactly. He wasn't one to verbalize too much. Not many guys, I guess, are, but he wasn't saying too much. So I asked his son, who always came with him, what do you like about your father coming to get checked? And he goes, he doesn't beat me anymore. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I'll be back in a moment. <laughs> you know, that, the intensity of that is amazing. But that was just his experience. Yeah, he doesn't beat me anymore now. Cool. Yeah. But, you know, that's the idea. You get helping someone not have all this activity that is like that idea of the full glass and any, any extra, you go over it. You know, you flow over. So here he was. It's like, whoa, that's, I'd call that success. I don't know if his pain was going away or not.
But with that, what do you prefer? He's in, not in pain and still beating his kid or, or, or the other way around. So my job is to help him become more alive, more present in the moment, more able to create that relationship to themselves. So the stories we have are, they vary. To me, we do, I think everything is a story. What I call a story is not just something that happened. A story is more a belief. That's how I use it in English. It's, it's more, it's a commitment to an interpretation of potential. So if I have a story, it's usually somehow I'm interpreting, interpreting interpre have an interpretation of the potential of how I relate. Okay, so I've committed to that potential. So my interpretation will maybe that everybody, no one's going to like me, or my my story might be, be, you know, if I walk down the street, they're always going to try to beat me up. You know, so there's different, you know, those kind of stories, and there's. But there may be also a story that, hey, I have, I have every opportunity ahead of me. I have the ability to connect and be alive with oh, most everyone on this planet. So the change in the posture is tr traumatic, or dramatic, traumatic. The other <laughs> one is, okay, the change, the other one can be traumatic. As you change it, yeah, no one's gonna like me. I'm, I'm gonna have to be careful. They've done a study of people who've been attacked. More likely, those people who are attacked, like say in Central Park, I think Central Park in Europe, they, they just, they, their posture with the tail tucked and a little slumped. So the tail tucked is like in a wolf pack, where we basically believe the story that I'm going to have to let, have to let people do things to me to get my needs met. So each bit of posture really has a story to it. We need stories or commitments to potential to define who we are, to be separate from each other. So those defining stories, I can't do anything with because all of me believes in them. But as I grow, I move past them. And suddenly those what used to define me can find me. Part of me believes it, part of me doesn't. That's what we're going to work with here. Because that's what you're able to see. If we dredge up a defining story, you won't, one, want to look at it. You won't want to see it. I can't understand it. It's not time. Let's work with what's time. It's time to work with what's confined. It's similar to walking down the street with a rock in your shoe. It's bugging you. It's bugging you, but you keep walking, <laughs> thinking the rock's going to come out somehow. And it's like, why don't you just stop? Take off the shoe and dump the rock. And then you look at this little teeny thing that fell out of your shoe and go, that was it? There must be another one. You shake your shoe more. But that was it. It was time. Don't be disappointed about how small the rock is in your shoe. It's just a story. So, but take the time to do something about it. Don't let it bug you and bug you and bug you. So where I find the confining stories that I need to work with, it's the ones that love me, that bug me. There has to be a story in there. It's bugging me. It's confining. So in network, those are the things you may run across. As you're getting entrained, you may feel some things. It's just a feeling, guys. We're so afraid to feel. I'll tell someone, hey, these, you know, some people come in in a really dire physiology state, like they've been told they're going to die tomorrow. I may try to jumpstart and say, you know, I think you're going to need to feel this. And you know what they'll say? I'd rather die. Mm -hmm. Do you? <laughs> so that's our choice. Do we allow ourselves to go in and say, hey, it's just a rock in the shoe. It's not that big. Mm -hmm. Can I let myself go into feeling when it comes up? Because if it's coming up, it means that it's, it doesn't, it's not defining me. It's confining me. It's just a story. Let's move past them, both physiologically emotionally, chemically, those are the kind of stories we'll, we'll store. So sometimes this, the chemical story will come out and may taste the anesthesia from a surgery five years ago. And I swear, I'm ch ch checking a friend of mine, he hadn't smoked in five years, 
and as we were talking, he coughed and a puff of smoke came out of his mouth. We both saw it and went, that's strange. <laughs> <laughs> that was even beyond our strangeness. <laughs> I mean, that can be pretty strange. But that was a little past my, you know, it's like, no, yeah, and there it was. It was still sitting there. Was, oh. And so, you know, chemically it'll come out, physiological people, physiological people. <laughs> I haven't felt this pain in 20 years. I don't know why is it back. And then after about a little while, I said, now it's gone. Or one of the practice members who had, she was in her 60s, and she'd had twisted ribs since she was 13 when she'd had pneumonia. So always had had this twisted ribs in this posture. <laughs> about three months into care, she got pneumonia. But it was only for a few days, she said. It wasn't bad, it was strange. From that point on, in the next two, two or three months, her ribs completely normalized into these vibrant, ungnarled ribs into a beautiful rib cage. Extraordinary. It, it's just not something you see every day. But that is the, the power of the body getting out of its own stories. She had a story since she was 13 about it somehow, physiologically, mentally, emotionally. I don't know. I don't have to know. My job is to begin the process and you live your life. Now let's review what it is to be alive. Now, sometimes it's good to look at the other side. What does it mean to be dead? <laughs> so, so if you see something laying there in the road, I think it's dead because it's not moving. I think it's dead because oh, it's stiff. Or it's, yeah, it's cold, it's dead. Or it's not breathing, it must be dead. It's not very interesting. And stay away from that thing, I think it's dead. Okay. So when it is alive, when we are alive, what happens? We move. Oh, this one doesn't work. Let's try that. Yes. We move. We're flexible. So those parts, those muscles that are stiff, or our joints that are stiff. Good. No. Not <laughs> that alive. They're just not as alive. It just shows we're not alive. When we free up, we'll get warm. We'll feel the muscles. Sweating sometimes, just right over the muscle, all of a sudden it's sticky. It wasn't there a moment ago. But that's the muscle relaxing. Blood flows into it. It actually takes energy for a muscle to relax. Strange thought. But that's why dead people get stiff. They run out of energy. Mm -hmm. So the muscles can't relax. Well, the, the, the little fibers stay stuck together. So when you're warm, living things breathe. So as you're on the table, you'll feel yourself breathing to places you never thought you could breathe into. All of a sudden, I felt breath down to my toes. I had a great experience in my life. 10 years, 11 years, I worked in New York City, in Brooklyn, and also in London. I broke in Brooklyn and Long Island. Two huge practices. In New York, people don't hold back. Where I'm from in the Midwest, you can just Move your eye a little bit. They go, oh, I think he's mad at me. <laughs> in New York, he could go up to him and go, hey, you think of that? And they go, oh, I love you. <laughs> he must really love me. You know, you can go into it. <laughs> so in New York, there was really you know, this you know, network was developed there. And I know why. Because you met every type of person on the planet. And it was every type of thing. And they told you about it. So you could understand, wow, when this murder was like this on people, they're worried about stuff. When this bird's back, they can't feel their heart. When this is twisting, they may not know where they're going in life. So, and then when this the low neck's back, they're pretty angry about stuff. So, uh, the posture we hold, and which vertebra are misaligned, or in the chiropractic sense, or are uh, holding the story, will often show us a little bit about what's going on in their lives. It's so fun to be able to tell somebody, is your mother-in-law in town again? How did you know? 
Well, last time she was in town, she thought I felt just like this. <laughs> okay, so it's it's reproducible. It's very very uh, evident to those. It's anything that's subtle is very blunt to those who study it. So what we want to do is help what's subtle become blunt for you. So these things in your, in your body. So what we've seen in our research and network is great changes in aliveness in different wellness categories. What we've seen is the body starts reorganizing. The brain has been studied by people at the University of Southern California and shown that it actually reorganizes to a higher level of function as network care progresses. And they, they can actually put electrodes on you and say what level of care you're at by the organization of your nervous system. Phenomenal. It's not about, is the pain gone or not? Because you still may have pains and different things. The great side effect of network, great side effect is symptoms go away. Understanding one last piece of physiology, and then we're going to move on and start experiencing it, is the fact that when the spinal system is in fight, flight, or freeze, when you're running from that bear, the spinal cord itself, within the bones, elongates. It unfolds. And if you can change the structure, change its function. The change of structure shifts you into fight, flight, or freeze. That's great, because of all it does. But if that persists with this elongation of the spinal cord, the body, set, the brain, and the rest of the body luckily has some secondary mechanisms to help you have a chance to heal and regenerate. Because it says, well, if my spinal cord is going to stay that elongated, i got to find some way to bring it into more ease, to change its structure, to change its function into something that will keep us alive for a long period of time. So hey, look at these bones all stacked on top of each other with these kind of like jelly donuts between them. What if we just squish them down? Make those bones closer together. Then the spinal cord, which is somewhat tethered to the top and the bottom, oh, it's going to relax. So it's going to contract muscles. It said, that's a great idea. So, but let's do it in a place that's the least likely, likely going to hurt us. Because we, we have innate intelligence, not innate stupidity. So the innate intelligence of the body will contract the muscles. Where do you think it would contract the muscles? Where the, where the nerves come out that go to the heart and the liver and the lungs? Or where the nerves come out that go to the legs and the pelvis? Which one keeps you alive? So the body will use the lumbar vertebra. For one, there's a huge area for the nerve to come out. You can squish it down and not even hit it. There's a big, huge disc down here between the vertebrae. So you can squish that area down, and the nerve that, if it does hit a nerve, it goes to the legs. Oh, I've got a pain, but it, it's not to the heart, liver, lungs. So the body's smart. It can use this as the pressure relief valve. The other place that has almost no vital nerves is the low neck. The problem with the low neck is there's a really little area for the nerve to come out, teeny discs. But if this doesn't work, it goes to here. So what do people come in with? Maybe 70, 80% of the time. Low back pain, low neck pain, oh my goodness, it hurts down my arms, it hurts down my legs. Well, that is showing that you have innate intelligence. So you can celebrate that you have a couple of heroes living in your body. These heroes are taking the pressure off everybody else. So you gotta congratulate them. Good job, good job, great, good job. Sorry, you know, you're hurting. But if you don't know that that's what they are, it's like if you, if you see the last bit of a hero movie, and there's some guy laying on the, uh, on the airport uh, runway bleeding. And what's that? He's dead. <laughs> no, he's the hero. Okay. So knowing that this is a hero, you can participate better. And so what we're going to end with here with this talk is to begin what we're going to begin now, is getting a better relationship to the now moment. As you continue during the day, I want you to revisit what we're going to do here. Because every contact we make, we want to help your body come into the state more at, in the beginning of care. So the first part of care is to reduce and release this tension your body's been holding. So you can turn the back on. The second part of care is then going to actually take those stories. Instead of just Helping the story no longer be real. That's the first step. The body's going to be rejected. Is the story real? Nope. Okay, nothing chasing me. Okay. 
The next question will be, in your relationship within yourself, is it true? Is the story true? But especially, when is it true? So your body will need to become and create wisdom. Wisdom is to know when is to know when something is or isn't true. Is it going to happen or isn't it? So when you have the wisdom from the story, you don't need the story anymore. Because you know. You can sit there instead of going, oh my god, oh my god, I'm going to be eaten up because this is going to, oh my god, oh my god. It's like, is that real? <laughs> Sorry. But when did, there's no when is it true. Oh, if I go into the forest and I hear these big stamping footprints and I hear a growl, Ah, it's real, it's true. <laughs> okay. But in between times, it's not. I can sit there and relax. I'm safe here. Am I going to be burned like a witch again? No, that was a while back. <laughs> okay. Unlikely. But if, I'll know if it's true. People coming with, with torches and pitchforks? That might be true then. Okay. But in between, I don't have to worry about it. So I can relax, right? So that, that's where we went ahead in the second part of care. The body will then start oscillating, creating this, these new organizational structures in the, in the brain. So, what we're going to do for our little exercise, and this is handily still up here from the last time I did it. Somebody is not using his board very well. <laughs> I lifted up this thing this morning. Oh, yeah. That right <laughs> looks familiar. <laughs> so, in this, this exercise we're going to do to help you get into the now moment, is I want to have, in every alive relationship, I want to have depth, occasion. There's three dimensions, really. We may go into having an alive relationship somehow here in a, in a while. But the, uh, to me, an alive relationship has three dimensions. One dimension is you got to go deep once in a while. you gotta, you got to see their soul. Because an alive relationship is one you want to keep choosing. If, you, if the path of your relationship starts darkening, you got to bring light to it. And one way to bring light to it is to be able to see their soul. Because our soul shines. We're a spark of God. I, if we knew a spark of God was down the street, we'd go look at it. Whoa, hey, you are one. So we want to help you remember that by getting the first fundamental uh, ability in all relationships. <coughs> is the ability to get present. If you can't be present with somebody, you can't go deep with them. If you can't go present with yourself, you can't go deep. If you can't get present in the now moment, you can't find yourself. Because you're lost. All right, so to get present in the, in the now moment, we're gonna, one, there's an exercise. I learned a lot about this from a man named Leonard Jacobson. He lives and breathes presence. He believes dogs are the highest level of intelligence on the planet because they're always so present. Oh, we're going to go to the park. Yeah, oh, my food, my food. Yeah. And they're excited about anything, and they're right there. Okay, so he thinks they're the highest level of intelligence. He gets it. Mm -hmm. So we may not intelligence, but of spiritual development. So he was, happened to be at my house one time for a barbecue, and I was living in the house on Long Island that felt funky. Yeah, everybody felt that? You're in the house. It feels funky here. You know, if the people lived there before, maybe something happened. And so we're talking about this, and he goes, come on. It's just a house. It's a structure. You're talking about the past. The past doesn't exist. We call it the past because it's past. It's done. So he led us on this exercise. Okay, come with me. So about nine of us followed him through our house. And he led us on this similar exercise to what we did. My little my oldest girl, at the time, she was only like two, maybe two or three. And she was following around, just doing her thing, playing around. And as we we're walking through, she kind of was just kind of following along with us. But as we got present, and really as a group, dropped into this space of presence together, suddenly I just felt something shift in this group where we're all were there. My voice dropped deep, you know, you just get into the space. And suddenly my little daughter went, oh. she started looking around and looking at everybody in their face. And, oh. and she was dancing around and looking at people as if we joined her world. <laughs> She had never seen us fully in her world before. <laughs> and she was so excited. So it was so dramatic shift that it really, really was marked in my brain. And so over time, then I've, I've always kept that in my mind. Because I know that as I work with somebody at the table, I need to be there for them. I need to be present. So it's, to me, 
I was so unpresent that I had to work with it every day for 10 hours straight for 10 years to learn how to be present. <laughs> because that's what never been. It's a practice of being present, of being there for you, but for each contact. So, I mean, having practiced this as much as I have, you guys who would learn much faster than I did, this is how you do it. There's, you take any sensory experience, because the senses are right here, right now. So what I'll say, let's all just put our hands on our legs. And the sense I want you to notice is the sense of your hands on your legs. And so we're going to get present through this, through this sensation. Get an experience of it, a depth into it. So what I want you to do first, and the words that were on the board, you can look later, you can close your eyes now. The first word to apply to this sense is to savor that, the fact that you are holding your hands and feeling your legs, and your legs are feeling your hands. Savor means to kind of like roll around in your mouth and taste it. Mm. This is delicious. What's it like to savor Put your hands on your legs? That is looking me right down my water. Yeah. Right. But savor starts it out. The next is to expand that. See if you can feel in your mind your hands grow. They get bigger. Then your legs grow underneath. They get bigger. Some of your legs are expanding bigger and wider in this sense of your hands. Start feeling how your hands and your legs aren't separate. They expand into each other. They expand up into your hands. Next, respond. Respond from the moment. If you feel like breathing, moving, <sighs> sighing, respond from the moment. That's what we have. The only thing from the past that's really in the present is wisdom. The only thing from the future that's really in the present is vision. Where are you headed? So respond with your vision and your wisdom. How do you want to be in the future? So savor, expand, respond, then value. Value where you've come from in the past. Value how it's led you to this moment. Value that your hands are on your legs, you can feel this. Value that you're heading forward into an amazing future. And the last is, and brighten, add light. Feel light go from your hands into your legs. Your huge hands sending out so much light, the light expands too. Your legs sending light up into your hands. Feel if your breath gets full or not in this. So savor, expand, respond, value, and bright. Luckily, they spell out the word serve in English, so I can remember that. Great, so there's the state to begin from. And then probably a couple longer than we expected. So we're going to get started. We're going to have a great day. We get to train together, Jack and I. And we love that experience. I've known Jack for a while five, six, seven, I don't know, a bunch of years. Maybe, maybe, maybe thousands of years. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? What's little? I don't know how things in the past in the past. I don't know. And I've been coming out here for at least five years or so, and, and I appreciate it. It's a great place to be, great place to come, and you find very few places in the world that you can come and find your stuff and, and deepen into who you are. So thanks for coming. Let's give Jack and this place a good hand. For